Okay, hello everybody. This is Mike here again. So I will, I've been wanting to have this talk with Matt for a while and uh, record, recording this week, the group we're recording is uh, MRRF. It's this Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And Matt's big into 3D printing. So I wanted to have him on kind of interview, talk about 3D printing. I've missed talking about 3D, 3D printing. So let's kind of jump in. Matt, kind of introduce yourself, your background, and kind of some of the cool stuff you've been doing lately. Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, so thanks for having me on the show. Uh, I'm Matt Griffin, Director of Community uh, Development at Ultimaker. And uh, I've been in desktop 3D printing from its earliest days. Uh, 2009, I was part of the original uh, crew at, at uh, at MakerBot, and then have sort of stuck with 3D printing through to Adafruit, uh, working on the shootouts for Make Magazine, and now here at Ultimaker. And uh, yeah, it's uh, and I, I really love Murph. And so it, it was sort of uh, it was a good opportunity for us to meet and chat because because I'm thinking very much about you know kind of the, the history of uh, desktop 3D printing uh, as I always do every year when Murph comes around. Well, I guess didn't happen last year, but that's not too surprising. Um, because uh, Murph is always a great place to go and uh, reignite your real passion for uh, looking at what's possible in this field, what you can do with the machines, what kind of applications you can bring to the table that are really unique. I've seen everything from really custom mechanisms, things like distributed uh, cooling using you know, various uh, electronic means to uh, a glitter printer, uh, which was a like a modified Z Corp printer, to yeah, just so much, so many amazing printed designs. And so when that time comes around, I always try to, you know, kind of. Well, I usually try to physically go. I don't. I'm not gonna get to go this year, but I definitely reconnect with a lot of folks who've been passionate about this field for a long time, uh, as well as some of the uh, the younger folks that are ra racing into it now. Uh, so. Uh, I, I've seen you at, at a number of these over the years, and at you know at maker fairs and other other activities. So it's a it's a pleasure to you know chat about three D printing uh, with you um, while we anticipate seeing some new stuff probably uh, this weekend. Yeah, I cannot I can't wait. Um, I'm trying to remember the exact time I first met you. I think it was in person. I think it was early. Uh, 2010, 2011, 2012. I think so. I met you at MakerBot. Uh, I think Brie Pet Pet Pettis was there. You were yeah. there. Uh, I think I showed off my robot. It was like a toy fair or something. I went to. I think that was the first time we met. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I know it was early. I remember. Uh, I, I'd always assumed that if they're if I was going to an event, they'd have three D printing and robots. But you'd, you'd <laughs> probably be there somewhere. And it was usually true. Right. Um, yeah. So um, I can kind of talk about some of the stuff I've noticed. I, some of the good stuff and the bad stuff about the pandemic. I know we're kind of isolated and kind of doing our own thing. And but I have noticed some some really cool stuff, um, at least just off the top of my head. Uh, you can like comment on them or you could add to them. Mm -hmm. But um, I've been, been really happy to see that a lot of uh, kids uh, teachers and parents have been really interested in Tinkercad, getting their kids started. Uh, I, I did a lot of uh, informal uh, uh, chats, uh, help over the internet through Zoom and other, other uh, uh, medium about helping kids getting started in uh, Tinkercad, which I think was awesome, especially over the last year or so. Um, I mean, it's probably been frustrating for kids because a lot of them don't have a 3D printer, but at least they can do designs and stuff with 3D printing. Um, yeah. Of course, there's, uh, I mean, that's been the biggest, coolest thing. There's a, because there is a lot of interest, I think, uh, younger kids uh, in 3D printing and design and stuff like that. So, uh, so the, I, the good thing is, well, I think we're always going to have new people coming in, uh, new people with all kind of cool ideas and stuff to do, because just, just the nature of 3D printing is uh, that kids seem to like to be able to to create something, to make and create something. Uh, 
out of scratch, which is which is awesome and super cool. And I, Absolutely. You know, yeah. And Maker Fair uh, stuff. Yeah, I mean, Maker Fairs plus 3D printing has been, uh, I mean, it, it's it's been always reinforced that uh, when when kids have access to this kind of technology really early, uh, they just jump native into it. They they understand it, they, they get it. Um, I, I've been using Tinkercad since uh, before it was acquired by Autodesk, and uh, even in those the earliest days when people were just sort of getting their feet wet, I would run into these kids that were like five, six, and they were designing their own like multi-part pieces in Tinkercad and printing it out. It's pretty amazing. And uh, so one of the things that I have done over the pandemic is I started a, a podcast series, Talking Additive, which uh, I've just launched, oh, in, in, in I guess, uh, tomorrow morning in terms of uh, when we're recording this, I'll launch episode 27. That's all been during COVID. Uh, we, I launched the first one on April 28th, three at once, uh, April 28th, yeah, last year. And uh, I recently have had the Tinkercad team on, uh, especially Guillermo, and have been hearing about ways that the that Autodesk really raced to make some adjustments and uh, roll out some, some details to make sure educators and parents as well could really help, uh, you know, help students uh, jump on and really use this even without the kind of context that, uh, well, if you think about it this way, when you're tr first trying to learn how to design something in CAD, I mean, it's, it's, in it's intimidating, it, you know, it's, it, you know, it's intimidating with any kind of blank page when you're making a 3D thing. So whether it's Tinkercad, which has a lot to do, you know, it really helps you with, uh, you know, kind of simple objects you could pull in and, and immediately start, you know, working on to, to kind of accelerate your on-ramping, but still a little bit terrifying when you start. And so uh, a lot, the way a lot of people learned was, uh, instructors would circulate and, and see what you're doing and help point out things, help you get the kind of muscle skills so you can you can see what the actions are like and the kind of ways you can work with it. And um, Autodesk had, had to make a couple of adjustments to make it really easy to teach in virtual context and hybrid context, things like this. And uh, as a result, it's, uh, you know, they had, um, they really served, uh, you know, millions and millions of, of youth out there around the world learning how to use this, as well as, you know, adults using this to, to really quickly get, uh, you know, easy to mention things that are ready for 3D printing. Because the thing that's really nice about it is you pretty much, uh, while it doesn't necessarily warn you about overhangs, uh, you can get a manifold object out with almost anything you do, as long as the, the pieces are kind of connected together, you're probably on your way to something that's printable. And that's, that's pretty, pretty inspiring. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, see, the, the funny thing is, is that usually when I talk to kids are really, uh, really into it because it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's not easy to use, but it's intuitive. They, they've seen interfaces like that before. So they can jump in. It, usually it's the convincing I have to do is with the teachers and the parents. Uh, they seem to be not resistant, but they seem to be the more, uh, uh, not have issues with it, but they seem to be the ones that have, are apprehensive about it. They're like, how do I, I don't know how to even get started. The kids just kind of jump in. You just kind of show them and they just jump and they start. Mm -hmm. They love the the kids really love the, 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 the shapes and the object to already come with it because they can put something out on the work plane and then they can start playing with it and modifying this stuff. So, yeah, I think they've done a really good job uh, with, with, with that tool. Uh, and, and there's a lot of advantages like over uh, Autodesk Fusion 360 and some of the other ones, uh, uh, Solid, SolidWorks, and because uh, it's, it's web-based, and you don't have to have a really powerful gaming computer to, to use it. So there's <laughs> lots of really cool. Uh, uh, and then, I mean, kind of outside of 3D printing, but the, the circuits, they added the circuits. Uh, we can do basic electronics, which is pretty cool. And then they have some kind of, uh, I haven't quite figured it out, but you can add motion uh, and building 
to to the design, uh, other than did the, the work plane and the, the the circuits. But yeah, they've done some pretty cool stuff and the lesson plans, and that they're trying to make it so it's easy for teachers to use it. So yeah, it's I can, yeah, it's been an awesome tool. Yeah. By the way, I don't know how much you played around with the, the circuits uh, integration, but you can add uh, potatoes and oh, use yeah. them as power sources. It's pretty. It's pretty great. And they, they worked out the math, so it really you know these experiments kind of work. So uh, it's pretty pretty clever. Uh, speaking of which, I mean, like over the years, I've seen you do so much stuff with three D printing and robotics. It's always seemed to me you know, that kind of mechatronics projects of any sort are kind of a perfect match for 3D printing. Um, have you been seeing unusual things happening with uses for robotics from your perspective? So that's actually a good question. That's another reason why I had you on. Uh, <laughs> so it's been interesting to see over, ah, uh, man, it's almost been, I, I would say, I think it was, Christmas 2009, I mean, yeah, 20, uh, 2009, when my hackerspace, makerspace got uh, a MakerBot cupcake. Uh, and yep. I remember spending uh, hours, uh, weekends, and uh, after work on the weekdays, and at, uh, you know, eight, 10 hours on the weekends trying to print stuff out with that thing. Um, I mean, just the, the technology advanced a lot, but. Um, I know when I was first using 3D printers, it was it was kind of funny because when I first started using 3D printers to print out robot parts, uh, I would get a lot of, I, I, I know my community, the robotics community, I would get a lot of people like looking at me like something was wrong with me. I, it, literally thinking that I was just stupid. Uh, but the, the, the funny thing is the same people had a 3D printer in uh, somewhere in their office that they occasionally use for prototyping parts because they would design something, uh, uh, they would design a robot part and then they would go to the, the metal working area and they would uh, make it out of metal. You know, they, they, they cut it and then fold it. Um, but they would actually, pro so I guess the, the prototyping made sense to them, but a, a finished robot part didn't. So there's been, there's been a lot of progress. Um, oh, there really has in the last 10 years, because like I said, 10 years ago, nobody was building the final robot 3D printing. Now it's, it's kind of, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's usual for somebody to have some 3D printed parts in their robot somewhere. Uh, yeah. And even the final product, even their final finished product they sell, they'll have uh, 3D parts, printed parts in it. Um, and that evolution has been slow, but lately it's, it's taken off because I've seen all kinds of uh, my friends uh, talking. So you have, there's a great uh, synergism or cooperation or working together with robotics and 3D printing. And uh, so a lot of my friends in the robotics field, uh, I see them talking about uh, the latest 3D printer they've seen the latest filament they've seen uh, and, and how the 3D printing uh, is helping make their life easier, helping make their prototyping <laughs> easier. Uh, it speeds up the iteration because it's really expensive. I can't tell you, uh, you've probably heard this before, but when an engineer is designing a part or you're getting trying to get a part developed and in production, uh, injective molded plastic part is a great example. So you're trying to get the factory tooled up and ready to go to, to produce your parts in injective molded plastic. And uh, the mistakes, the exp expensive mistakes being made uh, uh, where they thought everything was perfect in the design and then they created the mold and they started printing stuff out and they're getting into the production run and they realize there's a, there's a, there's a flaw or the defect mm -hmm. or an issue with the part. And so what 3D printing has allowed them to do is they, they, they can iterate so fast. They can just, they can create the design, print it out, make sure it's perfect. And they're not wasting any money. And then boom, they can start the production run. It's, it's, it's kind of 
it's like agile. I don't know if you know a lot about agile, uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, not manufacturing. Well, agile, agile, agile software, then now there's agile hardware and yeah. agile manufacturing. I No, I, I yeah. absolutely agree. A lot of what you're talking about, I, I've been seeing it and uh, and, and talking to, to customers all around the world about this as well. There's, uh, I mean, something that is kind of a trend in general for 3D printing, uh, you know, earlier in, well, I, from 2009 to 2011 or so, it, it was sort of exciting if the part worked. <laughs> and I was kind of, it was, it, was, it was kind of just getting up on its feet. And uh, there started to be some pretty good printers. Uh, that's, that's when Ultimaker was born, for example, and uh, the beginning of all the, um, you know, the SLA DLP work that was, uh, you know, really highly, highly accurate. But in general, those who were uh, focused on kind of consumer parts and really used to those injection molded pieces, they, they didn't see what the connection was. And, and uh, so consumers who weren't designers, they might not really get it. And it really took somebody who understood exactly what you're talking about, that you use this to kind of figure out your ideas and to validate them. And uh, I mean, it takes in any injection molded part for the most part that you're going to do a significant run. I mean, you're talking tens of thousands of dollars for the part. And so in traditional manufacturing, you really have to be sure that everything is right. You need to check it and double check it. And so that's what has led to kind of all the kind of infrastructure and, and, and stack up of validation stages. Uh, but now kind of flash forward to 2021, there are, you know, the, the printing technology has gone really far. So you could make pieces that are fantastic using a variety of, um, of technologies, including ones that, you know, you don't have to own your own SLS machine, for example, though I guess now you can actually, a company can own one. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but you, there are places you can get parts run for you. Uh, there's uh, a huge range of materials now in each of the technologies, in particular FFF. I mean, I'm I'm I've been kind of diehard for FFF the whole time. Uh, fused filament fabrication, the extrusion kind that's the most common that you you see all around, um, and uh, that space has com it, it's constantly renewed. I think that when desktop 3D printing started, it had the field had stagnated. It had been around since the uh, 90s, uh, but you, you only used, you know, FFF or, or the trademark name FDM uh, for kind of a late stage prototype, maybe something kind of functional, but there just weren't that many materials you could, you could work with. Uh, so still it was like a kind of a burlier prototype for the most part. Um, but that has really changed because now you have, um, it, it, it's reborn basically because of all the chemical companies getting involved and making really interesting, really pertinent materials. So now you can make reinforced, you use reinforced materials to make pieces that are really strong or that uh, are compatible in other ways, like tribologically for, you know, motion parts, uh, making it pretty cool to do like tiny little sliders and really work with limited footprints. Uh, flexible materials are getting better and better. And uh, even like things like ESD uh, safe parts and uh, ones that are, you know, kind of lightly conductive that you can use for, even for things like, um, you know, like chroming and stuff, and, you know, various, uh, you know, other processes. So uh, the technologies are renewed, uh, the design tools get better and better, uh, but also the thinking has changed. And uh, when I've been talking, so I've talked to a lot of, of customers about the industrial uses of 3D printing these days, because that's where a lot of this has gone. And uh, some, you know, people who are only looking at like mainstream media and haven't really, uh, they feel like 3D printing has slowed down or they see it, you know, come up with these like really fancy things from time to time from aerospace. They're missing the fact that actually 3D printing has exploded over the last, you know, three years, four years and is in every manufacturing process you can imagine. Uh, just not necessarily in the final parts. Uh, sometimes they are. There are places where it makes sense uh, as a component. Like say you have a product that incorporates a cell phone or a tablet or something. You can make bracket elements that are 3D printed and that can iron out the fact that <laughs> these devices change all the time. So you don't have to, it, it doesn't make sense to make 10,000 or 100,000 or a million uh, you know, parts to interface with one phone. Who knows if your customers even have that phone? 
Uh, so instead you can make bracket elements and uh, you know, just run the ones you need. And the, you know, the, the person who receives the assembly might not even know that 3D printing was involved. Uh, but that process has been improved. The supply chain has been addressed really well. Um, but something that I think is really pertinent to this discussion that uh, a customer I was talking to um, quite recently, oh, actually, uh, yeah, just, I just talked to Quadlock. So they do phone cases uh, and bike, well, <clears throat> most famous for doing a bike mount um, for smartphones. And they have a system uh, where you can kind of just, you know, lock your phone in really easily. Um, I guess I have, I actually have one. Um, so it's like, you know, you have these two parts oh, yeah. and you can just yeah. quickly lock it in. And, and it's burly enough to handle a really bumpy, you know, mountain bike scenario. Well, so they, the look of their parts is, you know, injection molded or, or machined when they're for late stage prototypes. So you don't think that 3D printing would be really that key until you start to hear how they work and how they're thinking about this, which is that they need to be validating ideas all the time. They have to move really fast and they have collaborators everywhere. And basically as soon as the printing technologies and materials get more and more matching their technical requirements, they switch to using them because the whole thing is pretty much digital driven they don't see most of the end use parts that they produce. So that's pretty interesting. Just, you know, that, that basically the, the process to make things has changed so much that you, you don't just benefit from iteration. You, you live and die by being able to validate new ideas fast enough by getting them in hands and accelerating those conversations about them. Uh, but then something that another team was talking about is, who, who primarily is making 3D printed parts for industrial context is they, they say that uh, for the longest time, most 3D printing was fulfilled by service bureaus. Like until desktop 3D printing, very few like individuals had 3D printers unless they were very wealthy or uh, Jay Leno or something. You know, there just wasn't, uh, it, it was too costly. And, and, and the, the, like the business models weren't there yet for people to understand uh, how they could use them. So you'd use the service bureau but here is where it gets tricky. And I didn't think about this until, uh, you know, really, you know, kind of studying this with, with some of our customers. Um, if, you, if you're in the business of making parts for somebody else, then uh, it's important to you to really clean up how it looks, maybe do surface treatments, maybe, you, you know, you vapor polish something, maybe you sand it, maybe you paint it, you do something so that that part fits the, the kind of the, the narrative of the, the customers receiving it. They, they need to receive that piece and say, oh, this is fancy. This is, this really, uh, this is, looks really like a great part. So what this customer is pointing out is that if you really, if you're, if you're an engineer or industrial designer, and you're making what you need and you really understand the technical requirements, you don't care about that stuff. And uh, 3D printing already matches your needs. And that's why 3D printing is vastly accelerating in industrial uses right now for things like indirect parts, jigs, fixtures, hold downs, everything to do with the manufacturing process. It, that stuff is tremendously shifting to 3D printing um, even if the parts themselves are not, uh, because you can, you can solve what you need. You have materials that can handle the strength requirements and all the engineering properties. And you're not fussy in the way that I think those early folks, when you were showing, uh, the, you know, you know, robotics plus 3d printing, and they're saying like, well, this just looks like a bad part, or, you know, they really weren't seeing the value there. They didn't, they didn't think about it because for them, they, they loved the, uh, how delicate and intricate those injection molded parts were for components for, you know, robotic systems. Um, so now, now that, uh, you know, the world is starting to get a little bit more familiar with the value that 3D printing is bring, bringing, they start to be less fussy about the surface treatment, or they take advantage of more post-processing or uh, other kinds of components. Uh, so, just like you were saying that, you know, these days you check back in with, with folks working on robotics projects and they still have, they have 3D printed parts 
somewhere in the assembly. It's not necessarily the, you know, the most visible one or the one, you know, uh, with the most forces on it, not necessarily, but I, you know, a lot of the stuff uh, in, in machine design that has to do with mounting brackets and uh, cable management and integrating electronics and, and all kinds of things like this, where there's a huge advantage to solve it right there, seeing what you have, seeing what you need, making it because an off the shelf part might be, you know, really hard to solve for that. Uh, but if you put that 3D printed part into a assembly with parts made in every single kind of fabrication you have handy, including off the shelf parts, uh, you have a result that other people see are like, oh, okay, that's really great. You know, they, they, they're not distracted by this idea that if you use 3D printing, somehow everything has to be 3D printing, which is, uh, that's pretty much gone away. I think uh, only the most diehard folks, which which is also, uh, so I think, um, you know, really think in terms like, oh, can I 3D print every part of this project? Um, and that's, and that's why, like, it, in context like aerospace, you have parts that are starting to, to flip to 3D printing, um, you know, often ones that, you know, are perfectly a match for the technical polymers, everything from, you know, like H, like, like the, uh, like ventilation related, uh, you know, uh, mounting and pipes, things like this. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the aerospace industry, I, not, I'd say loves 3D printing, but yeah, it's all over because see, I'm a, I'm more of an engineer. So it's like you were saying, I 3D print a part out and if it works and if I have no issues with it, if it's strong enough, it, if it meets all the requirements, I don't care what it looks like. Yeah. I really don't. If it works, I'm very happy. So like, I like to use the, so if you're a, if you're an astronaut going to Mars and something breaks, and you just you just pull up the three D design, and you've got your really cool space three D printer, and you print it out, and you put it in, and it works, and everything's fine. You don't care what it looks like, so it may not be perfectly smooth, and it may not be the right color, but you don't care because what it you know you're going to Mars, and you don't have time to spend weeks and days and hours. <laughs> Uh, painting and post uh, post processing the their 3D print. Yep. So I know aerospace and uh, th the other thing, the other interesting thing is is that uh, for a lot of specialized parts, like airplanes, have this issue, especially older airplanes, uh, custom cars. Like J you talk about Jay Leno, custom cars. There's a lot of parts that are no longer manufactured or made. Yeah. So um, if you get the design or if you can scan them then you can 3D print them out and then you could solve an issue that that would be cost millions by simply scanning the part existing part and then having it printed out and then and then you just put it in there and then everything's great so yeah that's um I've I think that's a, that's a yeah. good point yeah and it's it's uh you know it, it's sort of been funny to me spending time with a lot of like custom car and like hot rodders and, and stuff, uh, as well as people doing like avionics and stuff for, for, you know, planes, et cetera, is that the stuff that uh, needs to change or that is the most complex to source apart for is anything to do with like complex surfaces that weather or change over time. And so it's, it becomes not just a, a matter of like the part, you can't get a replacement for that part, but, but it's also like, if you think about like the dashboard of a car, like this is the dashboard that you have and you need to make a part and you need to make right. it really integrate well with it. Even measuring that and finding, you know, you're not going to find an off the shelf solution. You need to be able to, uh, to, to make a change and uh, make a custom part. That shape means everything. You might even use the uh, 3D printing just for the measurement and matchup and to, to get like the contours solved. And, um, but what, like with these, uh, like the, the customers are doing work in, in planes, um, like adding updated electronics, uh, you know, moving, um, moving elements out of the way to, to 
remount them in custom parts because you have new requirements. Like this kind of stuff, it's really nice having, uh, you know, this this means of producing things. I, I was I was thinking about when you were we were talking about uh, astronauts printing things. I just uh, interviewed uh, Chip Bobbert from uh, Duke University a, a couple of weeks ago for episode uh, 26 of Talking Additive, and and he was pointing out pretty much matching what you were just saying. He was saying, you know, that uh, Apollo 13 would have been a really short film <laughs> if, if they had a 3D printer on board. Uh, but uh, the other interesting thing is that now you actually have that scenario, like in that movie, where you have an astronaut in the International Space Station, and they identify a need, and they see it, and they, they can understand the requirements. But now people who are there can help participate in figuring out exactly what the solution is, and then you have a, you know, kind of a unit of fabrication, and you can produce what you need, you know, drawing on all that kind of brain power, but, but not needing to do the almost infinitely expensive, you know, task of like bringing a tool and a, and a, and a you know, missing part up to space. I mean, it just, it's, it's a yeah. catastrophe. And so you have this ability to do this. Uh, I think that's quite interesting. And so he, he kind of concluded that section by saying uh, that now finally people are getting over some of these expectations that, you know, everything has to be made out of metal because metals, what technologies right. they are starting to understand what technical polymers can do. Uh, but also, uh, you know, a part in hand that works is worth a lot more than a, a part that's better that maybe will come in a couple of weeks. Like it's, it's time to get these things solved immediately. Yeah. Yeah, you. I mean, yeah, I've heard a lot about. I heard a lot of stories. Uh, I know the. I know, like the Air Force is, has twenty and thirty year old airplanes, and simple things like fasteners and cable management. That those so those parts break, so that they said you got like a thirty year old airplane, that has a cable management system, and all the parts are wearing out and breaking, and and they're and so. But the thing is, not only can they replace the parts, like you were saying. In some in some cases, they can make the part better than it was originally. Yep. Uh, and so there's so many possibilities. So, like you said, it's it's all in the it's all kind of in the background. The hype, the hype's kind of gone, and now everybody's just jumping in. And and, and before I forget, the other really cool thing that you were talking about that. Um, so what's great about 3D printing is you create a digital file of what you're trying to print. And the great thing about it is you don't have to put the part in the mail. You just put in an email and you send it to somebody and they instantaneously get the, the, well, maybe not instantaneously, in a second, they get the part. And the cool thing is, is if, if you're willing to share the parts around, you might find somebody who can see the part and come up with a cool idea and make it better. And yeah. the iteration, so the, it's so cool about the, all the little things around 3D printing, the iteration, the, the quicking, the speeding up, the, the be able to transfer parts. So if I have a 3D printer uh, uh, and I design a part on my, uh, uh, in my house, I have a friend in Japan, I can send him the part and he can print it out instantaneously within an hour, a couple of hours, he can print out the same part. And then he can take the file and then he can say, oh, I would do it this way. I do it a little differently. And it, the, 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 the quick interchange, the quick agile approach, the quick iteration approach, I think a lot of people, like you said, in the last 10 years, a lot of people are seeing the, the benefits of that. I think at the end of the day, uh, something that has been interesting for me to see is that unlike CNC and other, you know, kind of, uh, you know, computer driven uh, fabrication processes, um, 3D printing more than anything is an extension of your digital design. And uh, to, to the point that, I mean, I, I, I make a case for and sometimes get into kind of uh, discussions about the concept that a, a 3D printed part is actually, you know, quote unquote, less real than the design itself uh, in terms of how these are used. Because you print something out and it's just a state. It's like, okay, uh, that's you know that's, that's that version, but you're probably going to put the information about how to improve it and uh, you know and 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 have all that potential to kind of do more back in that digital model. Uh, so uh, Altmaker has been doing a lot to push for 
uh, ways to, to network machines and see what new things are possible. And so we have customers such as, uh, you know, architecture firms like, like KPF that have, you know, offices all around the world. They have, they've used their network and they've connected uh, Digital Factory, you know, across their sites. So instead of doing what they used to do, which is overnighting, you know, around the world, uh, you know, a very fragile part and just hoping it makes there. So, so they'll send like three just to, just to make sure one of them makes it. Uh, now they can be having conversations and just sending files back and forth. And, uh, and they'll actually have, uh, you know, conference calls. So they're both, you know, both sides of a conversation looking at 3D printed part that they've made locally and just taking a Sharpie and being like, oh, let's, you know, this can't leave here, let's change this. And, uh, and so the, the physical part is the, you know, the, the kind of the means of speeding out, speeding up conversations and, uh, and bringing in more stakeholders. Like, I mean, it, architects probably in general can, you know, can look at 2D models and, and understand pretty well what's going on, but some of their clients really could use a help and, and it's important that their clients understand things. So now they can be at the same level as their clients and explaining why some, you know, a wall needs to move a little bit. Um, I've, I've even seen things like interior designs where they'll make a kind of a little playset. Like, okay, here's the space you want. Here's the furniture that you're wanting to put in the space. Let me show you why this won't work or why we need to bust through this wall. And they'll put all the things in. They're like, oh yeah, because you can't oh you can't pull the chair away from the table. <laughs> yep, yeah. yeah. There's no room for a bathroom. You know, so uh, it, it's really uh, it's really been quite handy. And to see so so that is. Um, that's been sort of in process the whole time, but it's really exciting seeing that really happen in a very major way in engineering design as well, where you can have multiple participants, maybe working in different systems, uh, all, you know, at different sites, everybody's working from home right now, or at least most people are, right. I am, uh, and they can contribute and they can keep adding their components and they can get that kind of fast validation that they would have had all meeting physically as a group but they can do it, uh, you know, at a stagger. It's it's kept a lot of these projects around. In fact, that was one of the key things that Quadlock was talking about. Uh, th it's a team in, in Melbourne, Australia, and they they were using Uber and like sending parts <laughs> across town because they all had they're all in lockdown, and so uh, so they they'd have the design designers here and the engineers here, and they could send these ideas around you know, within a couple of hours. And so they got through their list of figuring out like, okay, we can make decisions. We know which way we're going to go. Even though that wasn't the method they were going to manufacture. It didn't, it didn't matter because it was the efficient way to do it. And so now that we see uh, the really amazing functional materials coming out, we see the same thing, but people printing in, in, in a really good analog material to the final, uh, Part of machine design and just running it saying okay this works at the the place that it's happening i think uh in the most exciting way right now are the maintenance engineers on the factory lines so in the past i mean this is you know the kind of crew who who if the line goes down you know there could be right. tens of thousands of dollars going down every hour so so like it's a disaster like you, you want to keep things running. You need to be scrappy and find solutions. So they're used to finding solutions. So now they're looking at things, uh, you know, how can they improve things? You know, have they been doing kind of a brute force solution to kind of keep things running, but can they finally fix it? And they can add the stakeholders of those who are actually, they know the line, they helped put it together. They're seeing it every day. And they're like, you know, I need to round this thing off. I, you know, I do not want to use the off the shelf solution for this because it doesn't, you know, it's, it's a little bit too generic. I need, I need a custom solution and I can uh, put a little stay here and, and then I won't have one bottle of every 10,000 fall off smash. And then we have to clean up. And uh, it, it's uh, re the iteration cycles are really fast and they're working with machine uh, like, well, materials that completely uh, fulfill the engineering requirements. So in a lot of cases, uh, you know, while if they, you know, if they have a machine shop there and, and, and experts sitting on hand, maybe they could make a piece faster. Uh, but now any of them can make and test ideas 
without having a, you know, a uh, machine that's sitting there, you know, like making like, like, can you make me this little scrap, you know, that, you know, having an expert just to do that. So that person can now work on something else and uh, you can, you can make and test parts really rapidly and, uh, and figure out what's the, you know, most fit solution. Oh yeah. I mean, I can't, I can't agree with you more. Cause it, like 10 years ago, uh, like you said, 3D printing has been around for oh, well, almost 40 years, 40 years now. But like 10 years ago, when I started jumping big time into 3D printing, there were so many engineers and uh, uh, businesses that just didn't understand. They had a 3D printer, in their, well, one 3D printer, and they never used it because it was too expensive and whatever. And now it, what's so great about it is like you said, now um, if you have group of engineers are disconnected for whatever reason, uh, uh, they're in different countries or they can't travel or whatever. You could always 3D print the part out. I mean, you can collaborate, you design it, and then everybody can 3D print the part out and see it. And it's not that expensive. And like you said, you really don't have to ship parts back and forth. <laughs> if everybody has a 3D printer, they just 3D print the part out and they can look at it. And I mean, I'm one of these people, I like to touch the thing. I mean, when I 3D design something, that's good, but I need that validation of seeing the part or seeing it all together. Once I see the part or seeing it all together, fitting right and fitting together and working right, it, it gives me that validation. It makes it so that I know that it's ready. So yeah, there's... Um, there's even been studies that ha suggest that neurologically speaking, uh, it's just a much faster way to understand something. You, even you have somebody who has really elite 3D visualization skills, they can just spin models in their mind and figure out how to unwrap them. And, and they are ready, you know, they could cat up anything in a second, uh, but still you, you hand a 3D printed part to them that says things about, you know, proportion or scale or interface or something else. And it's like, boom, it's like, you instantly know, okay, I know where to work on this. And, uh, and you, so you don't, you don't have to, uh, you know, kind of hope that your, uh, your modeling of what, what, what's at play, what, what's, what needs to get fixed is the right one. You, you kind of, you, you really can, can test it. Uh, we're, yeah, I think we're at a certain level, we're still kind of monkeys who like to pick things up and, and bash them together and, and figure out things that way. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, like you said, there's some people that are really good at visualizing their head, but I still think most people, even the ones that are really good at visualizing, like you said, when they see the physical part and if they have two that they have to put together and they, they put together and they smoothly come together, then they, th there's that validation that, Hey, I'm done. I have finished, you know, it's okay. It'll work. We can, we can move on and, and so on. Um, yeah, it's just, and then real quick, before I forget, you did mention um, uh, the different filaments. To me, I think oh, yeah. that's where things are going, the improved, the better method filaments, because you have a lot of, uh, now that everybody's getting access to 3D printers, the demand for filaments uh, or for the different types of plastics and different types of resins, there's a huge demand out there. And companies, chemical companies are saying, hey, you know, we have this really cool plastic that we were working on, but now we have a reason, you know, we have a market for it. So, so you got companies that are saying, I can produce, hey, hey, ABS or PLA is really good, but I can make a little better version, better mixed version of PLA or ABS. Because I know that uh, there's some ABS, oh, <laughs> <yeah. laughs> there's some ABSs that, uh, uh, so for your outside, for outside uh, parts and stuff, the, the sun will discolor them and degrade them. And there's new chemical yep. uh, ABS is coming out that uh, that UV light doesn't affect them that much. Like uh, ASA. ASA. Uh, there's, I think you, you've, you I've seen you think uh, on Ultimakers promoted, there's a, actually a, a plastic that's, that's slick and smooth. It's great for oh, PETG. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, so yeah, PETG is, is really, we, we think PETG, especially the really easy to process one that, that we've launched as an Ultimaker, Ultimaker branded uh, filament just 
just a couple of weeks ago, really. I mean, we just right. finally launched it, the whole bunch of colors. Like we think that's going to become the new like baseline industrial part, like drafting material. Cause it's just, it can handle so much, particularly like chemicals. Um, so, so you can kind of use it in a lot of contexts where, where a PLA part would degrade pretty fast. Uh, including uh, UV exposure, right. um, but but there's also uh, you know I had a lot of fun last year talking to one of the team members from from IGUS about uh, their their move to to make a 3D printed 3D print material. So for the longest time they they've had their kind of you know their their secrets to how to make you know motion plastics that are incredibly functional. Uh, and so, you know, if you really wanted to part, you'd really, you know, they had a huge uh, array of, you know, component parts you could get. And that, that was already a pretty great library. But they had the foresight to, to see, actually, a long time ago, a, lo a lot longer than people think, um, that, that they needed a 3D printing material because they would have, uh, you know, customers who would have custom parts uh, that they didn't, they weren't sure yet if they need 10,000 of something. They weren't sure that it was, you know, it was enough for them to request some custom, you know, part design and fabrication through the IGUS factories. So instead they could run things. Um, and particularly for the kind of world, you know, we were talking about it like Murph, et cetera, where you have custom machine builders who are really trying everything and, and are thinking a lot about how to kind of reinvent the footprint of the mechanisms they're working on that they can now print sliders at any kind of orientation and the material can handle like thousands and thousands of moves uh with without even you know kind of breaking a sweat basically um it's really pretty interesting um because it's like uh that's the point where having the ability to make your own shape of any sort really starts to open up tremendously the the capabilities of what you can do um, and uh, you know, uh, there, there's just so room, so much room in electronics in particular. I kind of wish I, you know, I, I've worked on a couple of the projects that, uh, had to do with 3d printing electronics, which has kind of fallen by the wayside. Like even Voxelate with their like amazing rig has pivoted to mostly like footwear and, and some medical, I think. Um, so, you know, the, the, as basically the, uh, the PCB factories got better and better at shipping overnight and, and custom, you know, like low volumes. It got really hard to kind of kind of sell that kind of thing. But uh, but the promise of being able to to put a circuit into three-dimensional space and not flat is is pretty interesting and will remain interesting because you you can start thinking about things like, you know, printing things for inside the human body. Or wearables yeah. that uh, that where there's nothing flat on them whatsoever, and you want to really be efficient, or or actually take advantage of some contact points uh, to make sensors. Um, I don't know. It's it's pretty yeah. pretty interesting. That's interesting to say that 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 slow down. But I think uh, uh, one of the points that you keep bringing up is is that in certain fields you you don't produce thousands and thousands of a part, especially like in the robotics field, you're not going to make thousands and thousands of really expensive robots. So yeah, 3D, 3D printing really helps in that if you need to do a short production run, let's say two, three, four, and five. And the good thing is, is that uh, in the past you had, you had to produce hundreds of them. So you, and you just set them in the warehouse, hoping that somebody would eventually buy them. Now, now, not only can you uh, uh, print on demand, you can, through experience, improve the part. Uh, so you don't, you know, you don't have old parts that basically get old and nobody wants anymore. Um, you produce just how many you need, then from feedback and from testing and observation, that you can improve that part and make it better. And then the next time somebody needs that part. You can you can probably even give them something that works better, and with film it's improving. Mm -hmm. You can probably give them even something that lasts longer, is more durable, and it's it's, it's better at what it does. So, in a lot of instances, yeah. the short run, the ability not to have to produce hundreds of them, 
it, it, it's, it's a huge advantage. And you can also do things like part consolidation. So, so say, say that you kind of solve a whole class of, of parts and you know, you, you know exactly what the attach points are and you have that like, you know, troubleshoot it to the nth degree, it's going to work out. Uh, then you can get a custom design part integrate into it, uh, reduce the number of parts, lightweight the parts even, uh, to make it a lot, you know, uh, more efficient to run them. Uh, in um, industrial parts, one, one of the things that has been a trend for a long time, actually since, it, you know, uh, at least like 20, 2015, 2016, there were already uh, experiments where uh, industrial robotic arms would, would also send a, a you know, a professional desktop 3D printer, like an Ultimaker. And, uh, it, and it wasn't to do anything other than the grips, like custom grips and, you know, the, the final little attach points to be able to, um, you know, make it quickly to suit the geometry of exactly what you're working with is such an advantage because of exactly what you're saying. They weren't going to send a huge box with uh, a thousand ideas for, you know, shapes of objects. They, you know, they were going to give you instructions on how how to how to make a part, and then whatever you need to do, you can make it efficiently right there, and take advantage of that. You know everything else about that system that's already tuned for you. So I think that we're we're going to see probably more of that in uh, robotics in general, as you know, as the parts you know match the requirements more and more from a, a material standpoint. Uh, but also, as the um, you know the the the, the tool, like the software tools for design uh, be, get more and more accommodated to how to leverage three D printing for what three D printing is good for, and you know even use other uh, other processes to to augment it. Um, I you know like the use of off the shelf parts uh, like fasteners etc. Integrated into three D printed parts. It's, it's a, a small but pretty um, awesome thing to keep in mind. You, you talk to someone who is new to 3D printing and they think, oh, okay, here's the part as I would traditionally conceive of it. So now I'm going to 3D print it. Uh, but if you talk to an engineer who's been using 3D printing for a while, they might say, okay, uh, this right here where it comes contact the part, uh, there's a little clip, a yeah, metal clip. I can just get that. Uh, now I can mount it in, in this 3D printed part. And I get the best of both both worlds. I get the exact custom contours and the and the mechanism I want, but the part that's in contact that would be kind of fragile in a three D printed part. Nope, we can just solve that with a twenty cent part that you know right out of a local you know uh, hardware store and and just keep going. Mm -hmm. And so so then you now you see this kind of stuff all the time where people will uh, use things like you know, brass heated inserts to kind of drop in uh, mounting points into a 3D enclosure uh, because you don't, you, you can use this 3D printing as a tool among many and really understand it and understand its strength limitations. And uh, by having access to a whole, you know, palette of, of tools, you can, uh, you can make what, whatever you need really faster and faster. Oh yeah. So it's, it's more, um, so lately, it's more that uh, I found, like you said, I think you've said this a couple times, it's not you 3D print everything. It's not that you you take a project and you 3D print everything in the project now. It's a more of an integration and a combination where you use 3D printing where it makes sense and you'd use other forms of manufacturing, additive, subtractive manufacturing, wherever wherever that works the best. And then, and then like you said, that the, the the cool thing is all the new filaments are coming out so they can make things, they can prove things and they can modify things. So yeah, there's, there's so many cool, cool things I see every day. Uh, but yeah, yeah, too awesome. So, I mean, I don't want to take up all your time. Uh, is there anything that, uh, we've talked about a lot of stuff. We've kind of gone over. <laughs> we did. Well, yeah. Let's uh, circle back to uh, to Murph and the kind of spirit of going to Murph, you know, kind of anticipating what might happen this weekend. So I know, uh, I mean, I think a lot of people are going. I think I'm going to regret that I'm not physically going there. Um, 
but uh, there are also a bunch of attempts to kind of virtually bring people in who are, who are looking to kind of experience it so that, uh, you know, those of us stuck at home, <laughs> you don't miss out. So what are the kinds of things that you've seen at Murph that have really inspired you uh, over the years? Um, I, I definitely have my list. <laughs> the, I don't, it's so hard. I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna have a hard time picking out one thing. I think it's the creativity. Um, I think it's the, the cool thing I've noticed about 3D printing people, a lot of them think outside the box in a lot of yeah. ways. Mm -hmm. They come up with unique solutions to an idea. And that's kind of what's so cool about 3D printing is you could have an idea, you go, oh, I think if I do it this way, it'll work. Now, maybe it does it, but the cool thing is you print it out and you can quickly figure out that it doesn't work. And that helps modify and improve your thought process. So what I see is all these creative people spending hours coming up with unique solutions to pro to something I probably wouldn't have come up with, and then they can they can quickly print it out. They can quickly quickly say, "Hey, look, it works, and it's functional, and it does whatever what everybody wants it to do." And I mean, there's been, there's all kinds of cool things I've seen. I mean, with 3D printing inside of aquariums I actually had a. 3D printer in the aquarium printing out. Uh, I've seen people walking around with 3D printers on their backs, 3D printing stuffing out, stuff out. Um, 3D printing out clothes, you know, having a cloth material and then 3D printing over the top of it. I think it was a couple years ago. That was pretty cool. Did you see the project from uh, Joris uh, van Tuberheen uh, from the Netherlands who shipped a, a an Ultimaker that was printing... Um, a musical instrument to to a musician and, yeah. by the, and, and it went right it went through the mail with battery packs that it was printing and so it started when he boxed it up and then when it reached its destination it was done well, that's pretty cool but yeah it's um uh, i think it's more the i think i'm looking more for the creativity inspiration uh I mean, if, if I sat down and wrote some down, I could probably come up with some really cool examples of the creativity, but it's just the creativity, the, the imagination, the thinking outside the box, the ability to quick, like I said, to quickly, the agile way to quickly determine if it's a good idea or a bad idea. Uh, and it, and a lot of, what I like about the maker community and the, the hacker community and the 3D printing community is that failure, I don't, most of the time, they don't see failure as a failure, as, as a failure, if that's making sense. They see it as, I learned something. I learned something yeah, yeah. more about design. I learned something more about the process. I learned something more about um, how something works. Uh, and then that allows me in the future to uh, better be better at uh, designing or improving and stuff. So I know that's probably didn't answer your question, but... No, it, it does. It does because uh, I think that's what I thirst for as well. Like there, there's a, a association with the um, you know hardcore rep rat folks. They're they're really excited about uh, getting them a mechanism to work, getting a, a printer to work, make it really impressive. But the second it works, they're like, oh, bored. Okay, here you can have this one. I'm going to start over and I'm going to reinvent this because the uh, the idea, it's, a, it's an opportunity to really explore ideas. You know, how can you make a system more efficient and more robust? How can you uh, use an, a, a non-traditional uh, mechanism uh, that could actually really open up, you know, where you might put a 3D printer? Like you're talking about, you know, the unique context. Uh, I, they're always, you know, at, at places like Murph, there's often like miniaturization projects where you take like a big printer and you make it really small and cute and it, and it totally works. And that's actually incredibly hard to do, uh, at least to do elegantly. Um, or, you know, the opposite. Uh, people will, will take, um, you know, like machine racks and, you know, all, all kinds of, you know, 80, 20 and, and make massive versions of printers mm -hmm. so that they can make ridiculously large, uh, you know, objects. Like there's, you know, part daddy, uh, from the CBCNC folks. It's always fun to watch their 
uh, oh, yeah. you know, printing these just yeah. ridiculously yeah. tall yeah. objects with their massive delta. Um, and so you you get inspired by ideas. And, uh, you know, in, in, in most cases, when you're doing this kind of work, it's, it's kind of lonely because you're, you would be an engineer or industrial designer working on a product and, and you'd have to, you're trying to solve how to make that work. And, uh, you know, you might not have that many people in your team and, and uh, you might have a crazy tight deadline and have no opportunity to really explore more than your first three ideas. But with something like Murph, you get to see some of those same engineers with uh, a bigger time budget and uh, right. imagination budget to think, you know, what are some really new ways to change how this could be useful? And so if you go and you're looking to just enrich your imagination for how you might solve the next tricky single project problem, uh, you, you have seen a thousand ideas for unique things you can try. It, it really accelerates things. So uh, yeah, it's the people, uh, you know, more than the machines, because the machines themselves represent the people, I think, to a certain degree, that make Murph really special. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm going to sort of try to kind of virtually, you know, hang out with and, and, and check in on some of these folks to kind of learn, you know, how they are solving problems and what kind of new, um, you know, palettes of materials and strategies they're bringing to the table that we can all kind of benefit from. Oh yeah, that's why I like events like that, and, and I'm I'm really excited, uh, and I can't I can't wait to get there for this Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Um, but uh, yeah, it's um, yeah, it's the people. Yeah, like you say, lots of times engineers don't have they have a small group that they interact with, and this helps people to spread out their knowledge and their ideas. And sometimes somebody comes up with a novel novel or creative solution to something and they just don't realize realize that until they show it to somebody uh, uh, because you work on something and you're, you're, you're kind of head down and you're just kind of doing what you got to get done but you don't realize that maybe you created created something really cool that everybody's going to want to, to emulate or try to, to try to do or to try to follow yeah and circling around to where we started, when you're talking about Tinkercad, and I was just remembering some of these five and six year old designers who were just, you know, making amazing stuff, stuff that, uh, you know, would have been, I, I, I really wish I'd had access to any of this technology growing up. Well, there's something about 3D printing, uh, that, you know, as is also true of robotics in a very similar way that is the perfect feeder for, for catching people who are curious, catching people who have ideas, they want to try things in the world and arming them with a means of uh, rolling up their sleeves and trying to invent, trying to create things. And so there's always been a hugely important uh, um, part of things like Murph and Maker Fairs and all these sort of encounters in public with uh, 3D printing. Um, with uh, inspiring, you know, you know, young people who want to try this stuff, and students, uh, even students at the um, undergraduate level, who uh, may be in a traditional program before three D printing really took off in the last ten years, uh, they might have just faced mostly theoretical for like their entire undergraduate career and maybe made a capstone project. So they they go out to the world. I made two things. You know, you know now. Uh, you have um, students arriving at undergrad uh, who have a portfolio of machines they've designed. And so you, you'll see probably a lot of amazing students and teachers and professors at, uh, at Murph, you know, showing off the latest things, showing off how they even could teach with the kind of virtual and hybrid scenarios the past year. Um, I, I have a, uh, another project that I've worked on uh, I'm a co-founder of uh, Construct3D, which is a 3D printing uh, conference for educators. And uh, it's been going since 27, wait, yeah, 2017, 2018. Okay. I think, oh my goodness. I, anyway, it's been going okay. for a little bit. And uh, I, I can't remember if we started in fall of 2016 or spring of 2017. Ah, spring. I think it's spring. Um, anyway, uh, so over the past two summers, we've done these summer symposium uh, projects 
to make sure to kind of to, to bring together educators who are finding really good ways to teach using uh, virtual and hybrid scenarios because it's it's kind of a new muscle that a lot of people you know a lot of teachers who might be extremely comfortable at hands-on and applied you know you know with, especially when it comes to 3d printing uh, for them to add and so we have sessions all summer in fact I'm teaching one tomorrow on uh, uh, it's a little bit of an odd one it's it's, it's how you can um, get away from having like powerpoints and slideshows all the time and make uh, fold books uh, and use those like these handy little projects that you can physically make and fold up oh. as ways to kind of you know keep keep students engaged but also make something really useful to kind of transport around to kind of replace like poster sessions for conferences uh, but also slideshows in a class so like you might have a little fold book kind of like a little zine that's like everything you need to have handy for quick keys for using a CAD package or, um, you know, ideas for support material for your next project. And it's been sort of fun doing these kind of things and talking to educators about how they're engaging with this, uh, because you're also seeing kind of the front lines of um, how young people are becoming, you know, creative and more capable today to deal with a world that moves really fast with a lot of change. I mean, just the changes in understanding um, how the supply chain works since COVID has been really huge. Uh, right. you, you know, a lot of emphasis on, you know, being, you know, having on-site capabilities, uh, which means also um, a really great time to kind of celebrate kind of generalist backgrounds and, and wide curious uh, people who can, you know, find unique ways to solve right here, right now, a problem that, um, you know, you can't send off for a part to be overnighted all the time, uh, especially if uh, parts aren't shipping from that country. So. Oh, yeah. The, <clears throat> I mean, I know, I know that uh, the past year, year plus, is for, for, for kids and students and teachers and parents has been really tough and difficult, but I, I like to like to say there's been a lot of really good silver lining to the to the thunderstorm or the, the rain or whatever because it's like robotics and 3d printing have a lot of solutions there's a lot of ways they can help and i don't think people really saw those but now they've seen a firsthand where 3d printing can help in the supply chain where robotics can help in the supply chain uh where there's all kinds of so I mean, I had uh, I had friends doing research and development of robotics, and they were just kind of in their own little research lab doing their stuff and creating their own stuff and coming up with new ideas. But it's it's so much easier for them, you know, that when they say, "Oh, that stuff I was working on for the past year or two would be perfect for this situation in the last year," you know, telepresence robots, uh, all kinds of things where robots could come into the home and help people. Uh, they're isolated or they, they can't get out. The ability, just like the Zoom call uh, uh, or the you know telepresence kind of things, uh, and then three D printing. Yeah, the, the supply chains. There's all kinds of it, it. It helps focus this and see. Hey, you know what I'm doing can really make a huge difference. But yeah, yeah, I've seen that a lot in the last year. Very cool. Excellent. So. Um, like I said, I don't want to take up all your time. I think we've done, I think you've, <laughs> you've done more. You've done more. You've, I, I had a list of questions, but I've kind of just discarded those because <laughs> I think you've done a great job of not only answering those questions, but coming up with other really cool topics to talk about. And it definitely, I can't wait till this weekend. So I, I'm definitely going to try to share as much as I can when I have time this weekend uh, Excellent. Uh, uh, on Facebook and social media, Twitter, uh, YouTube, uh, videos and pictures, and trying to try to showcase what I think is some of the cool stuff I see this weekend. Cool. Well, I'll look forward to watching it. Um, yeah, thanks for sort of bringing, uh, you know, your your eyes there to, to kind of notice some of the exciting ideas that, that can inspire some of us who can't go. Cool, cool. Yeah, I'll try to do my best. So, um, so I want to thank you again. Uh, I've, I've run out of questions. 
Do you have like <laughs> any anything that you uh, that you want to follow up on? No, I think we I think we covered a lot, and uh, there'll always be interesting conversations about robotics and three D printing. Oh um, yeah, there's a reason it doesn't the the topic doesn't go stale. Definitely, definitely. Oh, okay, hey, cool. So uh, thanks again, Matt. And uh, I want to, of course, thank everybody who's watching. I hope that they show up and watch my uh, other videos coming up in the future on robotics and 3D printing. So thanks again, Matt. And uh, see everybody later. Bye. Thanks so much for having me on here. Really enjoyed it. Right, thank you.